So good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm pleased to be with you um, here, and I'm pleased I've been invited to come back to uh, Greece again after quite a few years. Uh, thank you so much for your interest, and I'd also like to welcome all those who are watching us um, from their offices or from their homes who are watching us online. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about what I have learned over the years from teaching the very young and uh, the young, okay? And um, I'll focus on a number of um, key things, not all of them because we only have one hour or 50 minutes, but a number of the, the key aspects of teaching young and very young learners. Okay, so let's first of all have a look at the content of this um, session. I will indulge in you know, looking back at when I started, which was about 100 years ago or so. Um, uh, we will um, discuss how the teaching of young learners and very young learners has developed over the years. Uh, when I started, it was very, very different from what we're doing uh, in young learners and very young learners' classrooms uh, these days. Um, I have um, actually enjoyed uh, an experience of teaching young learners for four years myself um, rather recently, and I'll be talking about that and the key things that I've learned uh, from that. And then we, we um, will have a bit of time to um, maybe look at a few questions. For those of you who are, wa who are watching this um, from home, um, if you have any questions, uh, do type them in the uh, Q&A box, please. Not the chat box, the, the Q&A box, and um, we will include those questions um, at the end of the um, session. Okay, so this is how it all began for me um, many, many years ago, actually in the early uh, 70s. I started out as a teacher of teenagers in Austria. There was no teaching of young learners um, in those days. Um, I mean, young learners as in pre-primary and, and primary. And then one day out of the blue, I got this phone call uh, from one of the, the supervisors um, in, in the school district where I was working, and he said, well, I've heard you are very interested in the teaching of English, and, and we would like to, to invite you to do a teaching experiment with uh, six-year-olds. And I was totally enthusiastic and basically had no idea what I was going to do, okay? So what I actually did was, and these were the, the, the first experiences I got involved with, first of all, it was pattern drills. Pattern drills based on stimulus response and based on a concept of behavioral learning. Um, it was things like, what color is the banana? The banana is yellow. What color is the board? I'm sorry, the question mark must have been lost on my way um, to the seminar room here. The board is green. What color is my shirt? Your shirt is blue. And we had young learners. I can see a few of you nodding your heads. <laughs> we had young learners answering those questions rather enthusiastically first. But of course, it, what it didn't lead to was communication. And that's not surprising. Imagine what would happen if I went out into the streets of Athens now, and the first person who comes up to me, I would ask, excuse me, what color is my shirt? <laughs> Most probably, they wouldn't say blue. Most probably, they would call the fire brigade, the ambulance, or the police, okay? And, and of course, um, 
it took quite some time because of a total lack of appropriate methodology and also content uh, for us to, to kind of discover um, what um, we could actually do with young learners to make the learning experience a meaningful one. There was, of course, also a lot of imitation and repetition. Because, again, of course, this is how young learners learn, we said. So we need to get them to repeat and to drill and, and what have you. Um, and that sometimes that actually led to, to very funny um, uh, kind of like experiences in our classrooms. I just need to fix this microphone. It's getting in the way of my glasses here. OK, so I was doing, I remember that well. I was singing a song in, my, in one of my classrooms. I think it was seven year olds. Old MacDonald had a farm, absolutely, OK. And uh, um, we will look um, a little bit into the world of a seven-year-old um, mother tongue speaker of German. I know there are some people in the audience who, who speak German. Um, uh, so what is this in German, this animal? Sorry? Hase, absolutely. Yes, Hase would be rabbit in German, OK? What's the diminutive of Hase in German? Perfect. Häschen, OK? So Häschen, that's the, a little rabbit, OK? So a farm for little rabbits would be exactly Häschen farm, OK? Remember this? Now. I was teaching them, Old MacDonald had a farm. What my learners were actually singing, I discovered after some time, was Old MacDonald's Häschen Farm. <laughs> so, <laughs> such phenomena were frequent because what we were doing with them, what I was doing with them, was devoid of any meaning. It was basically language and repetition of language. And meaning wasn't something that was in the foreground of um, uh, teachers and also material developers in those days. Okay? What I have discovered in the meantime is that there is actually a word, there's a proper term for this phenomenon. Old MacDonald's had a farm. Hessian farm, and that is called a Mondegreen, okay? Why is it called Mondegreen? Because um, um, uh, th there, there is this, this uh, American writer, Sylvia Wright, and in one of her books she talks about being a little girl and her mom reading out poems to her, and the line in the poem was, and they laid him on the green, and the little girl, a native speaker of English, understood Lady Mondegreen. That's why this phenomenon, this linguistic phenomenon, for those of you interested in that, is actually called a Mondegreen, okay? So how has the teaching of young learners developed over the years? Well, um, I think we can uh, say now that the days when meaning didn't matter or when um, uh, teachers and material developers um, didn't have or didn't focus on meaning as a very, very important strand in the young and the very young learners' classrooms, those days are over, okay? We are, we are now talking, and this is uh, certainly also um, because of what Stephen Krashen um, spoke about uh, quite a few years ago now in terms of comprehensible input. But this has actually uh, been very important for the development of the uh, more uh, contemporary concepts of teaching young and very young learners. So comprehensible and also meaningful input. 
and uh, when we mention input, we cannot not mention output. Um, production that when you look in young learners' classrooms where things happen in natural ways, and this is what I strongly believe in, that um, the young learners' classroom needs to be a place where children learn language in what we call a natural way, okay? So in a natural classroom, what happens is, um, what often happens between the mum and the child, or the dad or the granddad or the grandma or who have you, and the child when they're actually learning their mother tongue. Of course, there's a difference between learning the mother tongue and, and, and or acquiring the mother tongue and learning the, the, the first um, uh, new language. But certain things are important, and the, the thing that is really important is that um, if um, what happens between the carer, shall we say, or the teacher and the child um, works in a natural way, then we go beyond an input-output process. It's not just about um, um, saying sentences and the children repeat the sentences. We actually talk about the interaction where the teacher naturally facilitates and scaffolds the young learner's uh, production. Um, this would be an example of such a process um, between, don't let me down, between a child and her mom, and this is a native speaker of English child, okay? So the child picks up this t red toy frog and says, Santa Claus. Obviously, it was a red toy frog, so the child associates this probably with an image of a Santa Claus that he or she had seen. And the mom says, Santa Claus, that's a frog, honey. That's not Santa Claus, that's a frog, a red frog. And the child goes, frog, and then points to the frog, and the frog is actually on a car, and the child says, sit. And the mom, of course, doesn't say, well, listen to me, I'm going to tell you the correct sentence, and then you say it after me. The mom actually says, yes, he is sitting down, that's right. And the child picks up on that and say, um, and, and no, the, the next line would be, if I remember correctly, the child is saying something, um, frog sitting on car, or something like that, okay? So what we can see here is that language is not taught with the help of prefabricated sentences, but language gets facilitated, language gets scaffolded in this interaction between the child and the mom, and we're actually talking, we, um, Lev Vygotsky um, is talking about this shared space of cognition. It's not that in this shared space of cognition there is the child with her cognition, with her cognitive process, and here is the mom with her cognitive process. It's actually very much a shared cognitive process that leads to this scaffolding of um, language. Um, so um, scaffolding plays a very, very important role, and that is something that we cannot do without, and that's the reason why we need, in the young learners and the very young learners' classrooms, teachers who actually have a very, very good command of the language they're teaching. When we started with teaching young learners, it was like, well, it doesn't really matter because all they need to learn is a few songs and a few rhymes and a few words and what have you. But now we, we, I think we agree on the importance of the teacher being able to react in a very natural way to um, whatever it is that the learner needs in order to 
um, have her, her language scaffolded. And in such a process, of course, um, um, errors are absolutely not only inevitable, they are a learning phenomenon, they are part of the learning process as much as falling down is part of the process of learning how to ski. Um, um, and, and, and we know that, that when it comes to skills development, errors are important, actually, they are a sign of learning. The other um, uh, point that I would like to stress also is that um, in this development of the teaching of very young and young learners, what we have noticed also is, of course, that the teacher um, is more than the person who delivers the third person as corrected. The teacher is and has to be an educator, and I guess I'm not telling you anything new here, but I would like to stress this, how important um, the, the um, language development of a very young and a young child can be vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the development of, um, or the exploration of values um, and the development of the child's cognition, the child's um, thinking uh, skills. So, so we, we, we have gone, so to speak, from a teacher who initially was the one who had the language to a teacher who uses the language very, very naturally knows exactly about the um, educa educational needs of the very young and the young learner, knows exactly about how a child actually learns, and is also an expert in developing thinking skills and in helping children explore um, values. And now let me, let me talk a little bit about um, key things I have learned from my most recent experiences with, um, with teaching very young, or young learners. Um, it all started um, almost five years ago when I live in the middle of nowhere in a little village in the southeast um, of Austria. And I have a grandson. And about five years ago, or yeah, five years ago, he started going to school. And where we live, it's beautiful, it's rural, um, but the local primary school, and that's the only school there, there's no um, private language school or what have you, um, it, there's only this one little local primary school. And that local primary school is not uh, known for the teacher's expertise in teaching English as a foreign language. So I was getting a little bit worried thinking that my own grandson will actually grow up basically not learning English. So I, I thought I need to do something about this. So I contacted the, the relevant person in the ministry and I said, look, I'm going to offer to you that I will teach this class in English for free uh, if you give me permission to teach my own grandson and teach this, this class and if you give me permission to do my, my research in this, in this class. And I, I was very glad that they accepted that. So it was about five years ago that I, that I started to teach this group of um, six-year-olds English three lessons a week, which is not, as we know, a lot but it's more than one lesson with a teacher who is not experienced, and that's what they would normally have, have got. And so I, I, I was teaching the, there now in the, in the next, in, in the sort of grammar school and, and secondary school, um, so I'm not involved in that, but I, I taught them for four years, this class, and I taught them during the lockdown phases, I taught them on, on Zoom, I developed um, new ideas on how to work with a group of young learners online. 
And um, it, it actually was a fantastic experience for me. And it was an experience um, that I learned a lot from. And I would like to talk a little bit about that experience and the things that I've learned. The first point that I would like to, to um, list here is that the main difference between very young learners and young learners, from my point of view, is not about age. I mean, age is obviously a, a key difference, but it's not a key difference in terms of um, their um, cognitive processes. The key difference between um, very young learners and young learners, I believe, is the fact that very young learners don't have reading and writing available. And, and this is something we need to, to look into, and I'd like to quote um, Ong and Hartley here. Um, what they actually say is, fully literate persons like us, some of you are taking notes, um, we've all probably looked at text messages already this morning, some of you might have looked at newspapers, what have you. We constantly use, obviously, the written word uh, receptively or um, productively. Uh, very young learners can't do that. So researchers, uh, both language um, acquisition experts, but also uh, anthropologists actually compare and educational philosophers compare the state of mind of the pre-primary child with the state of mind of um, illiterate cultures, oral cultures of humankind. And Oman Hartley say, fully literate persons can only with great difficulty imagine what a primary oral culture is like, that is a culture with no knowledge whatsoever of writing or even of the possibility of writing. And Kieran Egan, educational philosopher, Simon Fraser University in, in Vancouver says, um, there are similarities between some forms of thinking evident in adult oral cultures, so-called primitive people's cultures, so-called only, of course, and in children's thinking. And this is the key difference between the very young and the young learner, okay? Now, let's just put our thinking into what goes on in the mind of an illiterate person, in a mind who creates a beautiful um, uh, kind of like painting like this one. Again, Ong, uh, the author who I quoted previously says, all sound for the illiterate person is inherently powerful. If a hunter kills a lion, he can see it, touch it, feel it, and smell it. But if he hears a lion, if he hears a lion, he must act because the sound of the lion signals its presence and its power. Speech is a form of sound that shares this common power. A text, a text on paper, can be ignored. In some languages, there are sayings like, paper is patient, okay? Uh, not in English, I think. Um, a text can be ignored, it's just writing on paper, but to ignore speech can be unwise. Our basic instincts compel us to pay attention. So it's a very, very different cognitive state that pre-primary learners are in. They are not like us constantly using um, the written word as a memory anchor, as a source of information, um, as also, of course, a source of entertainment, um, uh, like those of us who are avid readers um, uh, do. So we need to think, when we think of very young learners, we need to think of ways of using visuals 
that support their cognitive process um, in a way that is a bit similar to what oral cultures are doing with their war paintings, if you know what I mean. Because these war paintings, they were actually narratives in many, many um, ways. So here is a little song, and I would just, do you mind if we sing a song together? <laughs> okay, let's, let's try. I'm actually asking my, my colleagues back there to, when I sing along, maybe mute me a little bit. We don't want two people at home in front of their screens to suffer from my singing, okay? Well, anyway, here goes. So the song is, I'm on my little bike. Ting, ting, ting. Everybody? I'm on my little bike, ting, ting, ting. I'm on my little bike, ting, ting, ting. I'm on my little bike, I'm on my little bike, I'm on my little bike. And by the way, talking about the power of sounds, children are fascinated by sounds they know um, the representations of in their own language, and then they compare it to, to um, a sound like ting, ting, ting in English. What would the bike sound be like in, in Greek? Ring, okay, lovely. And then we have, I'm in my little car, vroom, toot, toot. I'm in my little car, vroom, toot, toot, etc., etc., etc. I'm on my little train, choo, choo, choo. And last but not least, and we did some research with um, uh, English pre-primary children about the, the, the sounds here. I'm in my little plane, Woo, 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 and when the plane takes off, they all said, no, it's not woo, it's wee, okay? <laughs> Let me just start the song, and maybe you want to just do the movements with me and sing along, okay? I'm on, I'm on my little bike, a song. I'm on my little train. I'm on my little train. Choo choo. I'm on my little train. Choo choo choo. I'm on my little train. I'm on my little train. I'm on my little train. Choo choo choo. And last but not least, I'm in my little plane. In my little plane, woo, woo, woo. I'm in my little plane, woo, woo, woo. I'm in my little plane, I'm in my little plane, I'm in my little plane, woo, woo, woo. Thanks for singing along. Okay. And here we go. My next point, the next point I have learned is that the total physical response, very well known, um, is actually, I think, the world's most misunderstood ELT method. And this may sound a little bit surprising, but I'm convinced of what I'm saying, actually. And I have a question. Which of these 
are not about TPR. Any courageous tries? Well, look, I should be punished for asking this question because none of them are about TPR, okay? None of them are about TPR. Um, some of them have movement as part of the learning process, but they are not about TPR. Okay, and that's something I have learned over the years that even some of my editors, whenever there is some movement involved, think, ah, this is TPR, an action song, TPR, a finger rhyme, TPR. Well, actually, in order for something to be a TPR activity, it needs to have certain methodological steps because TPR as developed by, by uh, uh, James Asher, is actually a method. It's not just some activity, it is a method. And this is where I would actually like to do a little bit of TPR with you. Will you mind in a minute to stand up and do some TPR with me? Wait a moment. Will you do that with me? Uh, how many people in here speak Italian. Okay, fantastic. I will teach you. I will teach you a little bit of Italian. And you people watching this at home, I know it might look a little bit strange if you in a minute stood up and did the activity with us in front of your screen, but maybe you might like to be involved in an interesting learning experience, okay? Let's start with this, okay? Il topo. Il topo. Everybody, il topo. Il topo. Il topo. Il buco. Il buco. Il buco. Il topo. Il buco. La credenza, la credenza, la credenza, il topo, il buco, la credenza, il formaggio, il formaggio, ok, once more, il topo, il buco, La credenza, il formaggio. Are you still there in front of your screen? I can see you're not doing the activity with us. Come on, everybody, okay? Now, can I ask you to stand up, please, and just do this, this um, with me, okay? Il topo. Esce dal buco. Il topo esce dal buco. Va a credenza. Okay, once more. Va a credenza. Fantastic. Okay. Once more from the beginning. Il topo esce dal buco. Va a credenza mancia il formaggio e dorme mancia il formaggio e dorme okay once more from the beginning il topo esce dal buco va a credenza mancia Il formaggio e dorme. Papà ha fame. Papà ha fame. Prendi, prende il formaggio. Prende il formaggio. Il... Um, Il topo scaccia. 
scappa giù, il, il topo scappa giù, papà scappa dalla cucina, il papà scappa dalla cucina. Ok, thank you very much. Sit down, please. Now, now I'm sure your Italian is almost on A2 level now, <laughs> while mine is still on A1. <laughs> okay, now, we all know that um, what the teacher does here is the teacher um, gives the student sentences, um, models the action, and the students imitate. And many young learners will do what you kindly did. They will repeat what the teacher actually says, okay? Um, then the next stage would be, and I haven't been doing this with you, but I would ask you to actually um, uh, carry out the actions without my model, okay? So if I said to you now, um, il um, dopo esce dal buco, what would you do? Va al credenza? Mm -hmm. uh, mangia il formaggio e dorme? Exactly. Papà ha fame? Prende il formaggio? Il, um, um, il dopo salta giù? Il dopo? Il dopo? S exactly, salta giù. Papà scappe dalla cucina. Okay, we know that. We're doing it in the same order. And with our learners, we'll do this several times until they are at ease with carrying out the actions. And then the teacher would actually jumble the order of the action. So I would, for example, say, scappe dalla cucina. Papa scappe dalla cucina. And you would do this. Okay? And I would say, for example, il topo esce um, dal buco. Exactly, you would do this. Okay, all fine. So this is what some people believe the total physical response is all about. It is, but there is something significant missing here. And that somehow, I think, got lost. And that is the most important part about the total physical response, because without it, the total physical response is just stimulus response. It's learning, it's like dog training, it's like learning on, uh, I don't know, um, it's, it's, it's just behavioral learning. And it goes far beyond behavioral learning. It's actually a very, very powerful um, um, uh, cognitive process that leads to receptive creativity first. It's about the aha moment of understanding something that you've never heard before. It's extremely powerful if and when the teacher remembers that James Asher said there is a fourth stage, and the fourth stage is what Asher calls the novel command. I don't talk about commands when we do TPR with our very young and young learners. Uh, I talk about instructions, okay? But novel instructions are extremely important. So, just for a moment, imagine that I'm um, uh, saying now, um, Papa va a credenza. Okay. Um, papa mancia. Il topo. <laughs> Perfect. And you go, ah! And this is what the total physical response needs to lead to. It's, it is, um, when you look at the process of cognition there, it's not just about repeating. It is about understanding. It's about understanding new language. You have probably never heard before, il papa mancia um, il, il topo. But you understood it because of what we have gone through before. 
So a novel instruction is a completely new command that has been put together by the teacher using uh, elements of language the learners have learned before. And if that is missing, then it's not TPR. And that is extremely, extremely, extremely um, uh, important. Of course, then we know that um, we can use images, we can work on the student's comprehension further, and so on and so forth, and that is important too. But the key process of TPR is this novel instruction um, uh, process. I'm not going to tell you an anecdote here for time reasons, but there will be a few um, uh, anecdotes later. So, the learner goes from present perception to a desired future stage or state of understanding new language. And in order to do that, we need insight and we need the actions. And James um, um, Zal, neurobiologist, says this grasping process, the moment when they understand something that they'd never heard before, this grasping process is of more use than we might think. We use it to achieve all sorts of goals, from learning to tying our shoes. The moment when the, the young child learns to tie their laces, and suddenly they got it. Um, from tying our shoes to writing to unlocking doors, we also use it as a metaphor for mental and psychological actions such as grasping an idea or seizing the moment, okay? So that is key, I believe. I'm actually um, working on a book on, on revisiting TPI at the moment. This has gone completely missing. People have just forgotten about this fourth uh, phase, it seems to me. The third point is about not teaching grammar, but helping our learners notice grammar even young learners, and that is important. I believe in teaching. I believe that um, we cannot just say, well, everything is going to take care of itself. It's not, because we don't have endless time. With your young learners, you have a few hours a week, and we need to use them wisely. And this is why I believe, um, uh, by the way, that um, a, a real program for teaching young learners uh, needs to be very, very carefully thought out and cannot just rely on a few nice songs and, and a little rhyme here and a little rhyme there. It needs to be dovetailed and developed, okay? So let me tell you a little anecdote here that comes from uh, a co-author of mine who, whose name uh, uh, I'm sure many of you know, Scott Thornbury. We have, we have recently um, written the second edition of our, our book together, uh, Teaching Grammar Creatively. And Scott tells a little story which is actually about a teenage learner, but it's a lovely anecdote that I think is, is, is um, uh, a good metaphor here at this stage. Scott, as a young teacher, was teaching in, in Cairo, in Egypt. And he said it was one Sunday afternoon, I was walking down the, the street, and um, suddenly I saw coming up to me one of my students, Ahmed, um, a 16 or 17 year old, carrying a sports um, bag over his shoulder. And Scott said, well, I, I wanted to do a bit of small talk. And I said, hi, Ahmed, um, what are you up to? And Ahmed answered, I go to the club. And Scott, being Scott and one of the world's leading grammarians, thought I need to facilitate and scaffold his um, present continuous a little bit here. And he said, Ahmed, I'm... And Ahmed said, oh, go going went, what does it matter? <laughs> and it's a beautiful anecdote because and this is the same with, with children, actually. Um, they won't use the correct structure unless they become aware of its functional need. Not its grammatical need, its functional need. Uh, so, so 
um, we start using structures as soon as we notice that a certain structure makes a difference, which is, by the way, why the, fam the famous third person S is so late acquired, but because it doesn't make much difference, functionally speaking. It does, of course, for us and our ears, grammatically um, uh, speaking, okay? So um, the, the key thing is the functional meaning here. Let's have a look at, at something. Um, this was actually me with, with six-year-olds on, on plural S's, okay? Um, I point to the banana and, uh, no, I say to a child, sorry, point to the banana. And the child actually points to the picture with the three bananas. And I say, no, that's bananas, okay? And I, 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 I point there again, too. That's bananas. And then I say, um, the, the child then says, banana. And she points at the one banana and says, uh, banana. And I go, yes, very good, that's the banana. See what I mean? Showing them the difference, m helping them notice the difference between um, uh, the two uh, structures. Um, another example of how we can facilitate noticing is through anticipatory form introduction. I've come up with this term. It's not the most catchy term I'm aware. But what I mean is, imagine teacher wants to teach this and that and these and those in the next lesson or the next few lessons. Then you can, for example, um, uh, put a few little boxes or what have you on your desk, let's say of different color and what have you, and you can see, you can say, um, Sandra, give me the red box, give me the red cube, please. And she goes and picks, I don't know, that one there. And I can say, no, not that one, this one here. You see what I mean? So I'm introducing this receptively using, um, in this case, uh, realia, the children are beginning to understand, but I'm not making a big fuss about it, that I'm teaching the Ixis or what have you, and then in one of the next few lessons, I will teach it more properly. So, in other words, help them notice first. Okay. Uh, the next um, uh, point is about stories. It's about using the right stories to develop language implicitly, okay? And I think what I have learned is that um, working with stories goes far beyond language, okay? Now, we are used to, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to put language into your mouth, but many teachers are used to seeing stories as a vehicle for language. And of course they are in some ways, because stories contain language. But stories are only stories if they go beyond language. If there's something in them that makes them worth listening to, from the point of view of the learner's brain, other than language, okay? So some neuroscientific insights into the importance of story. The first one is that the brain is wired for story, and this is um, a, almost a quotation that actually comes from a book by Lisa Kron called Wired for Story, who says actually that um, the human mind is constantly on the lookout for stories, not as entertainment, but as meaningful and insightful um, narratives. We tell stories to each other and we listen to stories that speak to us, not because we, we think, ah, that person's telling me a story now, so I'm, 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 I'm listening to some good language. No, what we're actually interested in is What's in that story for me? 
what, what's, what, how can I use? That's what the brain thinks, okay? How can I use what I'm learning from here for my own future? That's why stories are so important. The second one is that stories are about, or the process of listening to stories or reading to stories or watching a movie is about prediction. Like Steven Pinker says, minds exist to predict what will happen next. We're doing this all the time. We are all the time in our daily lives making predictions. And by the way, people developing artificial intelligence say that this is the biggest challenge for them. The human mind is able to constantly predict and it's extremely difficult to program a computer system to make predictions. We do this all the time when we listen to a story. And the third point, and, and um, this is something that this um, um, uh, image here reminds us of, when we listen to a story, we do not just focus on the language. We create images, we create sounds, we we, we develop smells and tastes like in a fantastic meal in a Greek restaurant, okay? And the fascinating thing about the human mind is that imagined se sensory activation, the sounds we hear inside of our head and the images we make and the smells and tastes and, and, and scents we produce, they are as real because they use the same sensory circuits in our brain as real sensory experiences, okay? So um, stories that speak to us rewire the brain, okay? Listening to a story that speaks to us causes changes in our neuronal networks, okay? So that's... Um, um, what I have learned, and I'd like to conclude with, with um, number five here on, in my list, that teaching English to, to very young learners and to young learners is so worthwhile. When I actually um, think back to the, the, the sort of like final few months of this four-year teaching experience, the amount of language the kids had learned was just fascinating. They, they had actually developed little videos using mobile phones of them telling little stories, of um, uh, doing uh, role plays and what have you. We worked online. I worked online with them. I did Zoom meetings in breakout rooms etc., etc., etc. I developed buddy learning systems. I could talk for another um, uh, day about all this. But, but my um, key learning or takeaway here is that it's so worthwhile. And I'm saying this with great satisfaction because there are serious language teaching methodologists who say and also write in their books that it's not worth putting in all the effort and the money to teach young learners because when they start at the age of 10 or so, they can make up um, uh, for this uh, very, very easily. And they cannot. And they cannot. Of course, um, we, we have 30-year-olds who started to learn a language and in two years' uh, time had um, uh, achieved near nativeness. Those people exist. But they're not, they're not millions of those people out there, okay? While we know that a young learner and a very young learner, if they are taught properly in a natural way, then um, they can actually... Um, achieve a lot and um, we, can, we can also make the learning experience itself such a fun and satisfying process. Okay, that was my session. Thank you so much for listening and for participating so actively actually, right, in, in the TPR and the singing. Thank you. Thank you.
Now, let me know, is there anybody who has any comments or any questions, anything you'd like to share with us? Yes, please. Uh, can we, we have a microphone for you, I think. My question uh, would be whether you've tried CPR uh, with uh, A2 and above level. I mean, CPR, the way you uh, brought it here and reminded us very well of some certain elements that went missing, um, would be ideal to practice from stage uh, early beginning up to where? I mean, how far can one go with CPR? That's my question. Okay. Uh, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you. There are some people who claim that you can basically pack every, every language um, structural area into TPR. I have my doubts, I must say. So for me, TPR is an excellent method for uh, working with young learners and working maybe up to A2. If we... Um, use what I call action stories. That's, that's something I have written about together with Günter Gerngos in a book called uh, Do and Understand. Um, I, there are certain ways, like for example, you can say, you can sort of, you have a little box here and you have different pieces of chalk in there and you say to a learner, okay, stand up, come to the board. If you find a piece of yellow chalk, draw a flower on the board. You see what I mean? So, so you can go into certain structures, but I personally, although I have worked a lot with TPR, I cannot see myself using it beyond A2. Um, um, I have also used TPR very successfully with, with adults. Not so much, but again, beginner and, and sort of uh, post-beginner. Um, um, not so much with teenagers, because teenagers go through a phase where they're very self-conscious and then they don't like acting out movements in front of, of others. It feels a bit awkward for them. This is the answer that I kind of expected. I mean, that's what I also thought would be suiting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that uh, at the age of four or three, uh, reading and writing are not available. To most children. To most children. And I know that um, um, most of the scholars agree with this. In my school, I don't know if it was the synthesis of my children, four-year-old, they wanted to read yes. and write. And uh, we started after the first two months. Mm -hmm to recognize the written words mm -hmm. together with a picture, mm -hmm. and they wanted to write. Mm -hmm. In the next years, we added the Jolly Phonics and Phonics by QLS, and so they started reading after the first month, four-year-olds, mm. and they wanted to write. So we do all four skills from kindergarten mm. A. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Some people say, uh, Jenny, don't do it. But I do it. Yeah, thank you for, for thank saying you. that. I taught my, my grandson to read when he was four, <laughs> but in his mother tongue. In his mother tongue. I, I personally, I mean, this is a um, question of belief. I don't think children should learn to read and write in, the, in, the, in another language, in a, in a, let's call it foreign language or second language before they have actually done so in their mother tongue. They, they can, of course, a four-year-old can, can learn to read and to write. In, in the UK, actually, quite a few children learn to, to um, read before they are six. I personally would do it in the mother tongue first, and I have my, my, my research reasons for that. And I also would space out the reading process from the writing process. So. Uh, they need to learn to read first before they learn to write. I know that it's often done simultaneously. Um, uh, there are um, neurological reasons why it would actually be good to teach the reading process first and then the writing process. 
that's my my answer based on on um, the things I have um, uh, read and I know about the neurology. Can we have the the microphone again? Does that um, sound like recognizing sight worse because the light, and I don't know who spoke here, but I mean, uh, at a very young age, what they can do is recognize sight words. Yes. Is sight words recognition similar as reading? Because to me, it's not reading. So, I mean, phonics, for example, they will teach you very particular uh, uh, pairs of words. Uh, so will uh, sight words. Yes. But I wouldn't call that reading. You're right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that. Thank you. Um, okay, I am not technical in my teaching, and I don't know about all these terms because I come from the literature, pure literature studies. But what I have found and I'm very happy to see, to hear of it right now, is that narrative has helped me a lot to explain grammatical terms in classes five and six, where I teach in my school. For example, how can you, I was really troubled, how can I explain adverb? What does it mean, conditional? What, they haven't even realized it in their own language, so I, focused on its use for them to understand the concept of adverb. I entered the classroom with a football. So automatically that draws attention. And then I kicked the ball softly. And then I kicked the ball hard. So I asked them the difference. They could tell the difference and all of a sudden they knew what adverb was. And I tried to find this kind of way, so CPR, to explain grammatical terms before we go into the theory that the book includes. And I have found that this works extremely well. Conditionals, adjectives, for example, I make them close their eyes and I give them a noun, girl. So I said, what's the picture in your head? It's a girl. Now, what if I say a beautiful girl? Does that picture change? And so on and so on. Yeah, lovely. Thank so you so much. So thank you, because <laughs> I was kind of wondering, but it has helped, and it's now coming more officially. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think that's it. Do we have any questions from the colleagues at home? No, but I'll, I'll recheck. Nicholas is running for his running. laptop. Yes, I think he has one. It's one, okay. Can you, can you just read it out to me? Okay. It says, how long should a lesson at A1 and A2 level? Okay, yes, yeah. So <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I don't have any, any sort of uh, research, and I don't know of any research that says a lesson should be 25 or 30 or 45 or 50 or whatever. Um, it, I, I think keep to whatever you're doing if it works, and if it works well, then, then you have a reason not to change it. If it doesn't work, you might want to change it, but very often it's not so much the amount of time, but rather what you do in that time. So a young learner and a very young learner, they are actually able to, to um, um, digest and process language cognitively uh, for quite some time. If we are doing it in a multi-sensory way, if we are not expecting them to sit there and sit still and, and just uh, load language <laughs> into their brain-mind system, but if we give them an opportunity, and I think this is a nice lead over to what uh, Lilika and Susanna are going to do, if we give them an opportunity to, to sing songs and, and do chants and do TPR and, and, and what have you, so that they live 
the language and they don't just don't, don't learn it, okay? So thank you so much.